This video is part of a series of presentations covering the key concepts of multithreading and synchronization. This presentation in specific covers the producer-consumer pattern that is used to coordinate multiple threads. The presentation will review two different approaches for implementing the producer-consumer model. First, we will cover a busy wait or spin lock approach. Next, we will cover a sleep wake up approach by using condition variables. The presentation will also cover Lambda methods that are used in some of the implementation. Previous presentations focused on problems where all the threads perform somewhat similar operations and the CPU time taken per operation was comparable. That means the difference between the time taken for each thread to perform a specific operation, the difference was in like say a few milliseconds. That means the overall runtime of these threads and the performance characteristics of the threads were very comparable. And we looked at two approaches. First one is one resource at a time, where we used a lock guard to lock one resource and establish a critical section. And then we also looked at the dining philosopher model, where we had to lock multiple resources simultaneously to establish critical sections. And this is um, locking multiple mutexes simultaneously is important to avoid deadlocks. And of course, it's equally important to unlock them. However, in many applications in multi-threading, different operations are required. So threads may not be doing the same kind of operations and different types of operations will need to be performed. So in such cases, some of the threads might run much faster than the others because some operations will require more CPU compute time, some operations might require less CPU compute time, so on and so forth. So there is typically a significant imbalance between the operations of the threads. So for example, if you have many inputs that need to be processed, different inputs could require different amounts of time because they might require different kinds of processing to be done. So programs are typically designed such that different threads perform different operations. So based on the input, you might have different threads performing different operations. So having different threads to perform different operations does have its advantages. One, each thread is much simpler to develop because it is focused on a specific functionality. The threads operate on the same subset of resources and such, so lock management and establishing critical sections is streamlined. And having these threads run simultaneously, multiple threads run, gives you a better load balance and enables effective use of multi-core CPUs. However, a key disadvantage is coordinating these different groups of threads to operate can be challenging. And this is where the producer-consumer model or producer-consumer design pattern comes into the picture. Here, certain threads will act as what are called producers. Another set of threads will be classified or termed as consumers. And the interactions between the producer and consumer will be coordinated by using a finite sized intermediate queue or a buffer. So a producer thread will basically generate, process some inputs and generate some intermediate results and it'll keep adding those intermediate results to this intermediate queue, assuming the queue is not full. So the queue is a finite size queue. So if the queue is full, the producer thread will have to wait. And of course the producer threads wait when the queue is full. On the other hand, the consumer threads keep on removing items from the shared queue and start processing them further. So that means they'll keep processing as and when intermediate results are available, but the consumers will have to block and wait if the intermediate queue is empty. So here, this is the idea of the producer-consumer. Certain threads are going to be classified as producers. Certain threads are going to be classified as consumers. How you classify producer-consumer is totally up to you. So based on the application, you will do different kinds of classification. But the key is there is a finite size. The finite size is absolutely important. There's a finite size queue that is used to balance the work between producers and consumers. So the producers generate data into the queue and the consumers remove data from that intermediate shared queue and work on it. So these producer-consumer models is very widely used for, particularly for online transaction processing, where there's a shared finite size queue for interaction between producers and consumers. So you'll typically see it in action where there's a web server that'll accept connections from many users on the internet. 
and the transactions will be queued in an intermediate queue, maybe even in the web server. And then there will be a set of backend servers that will start processing these transactions from the intermediate queue and then start queuing up operations to be applied to a backend database server. So each one of these different systems like web server, backend servers, database servers will all operate with different numbers of threads doing different kinds of operations. And these intermediate queues are used to couple or coordinate the activities and provide a better load balance in the overall system. So keep in mind here, the aim is to balance the overall system throughput and performance. And then keep in mind, we also get better scalability in this approach because we'll be able to use multiple threads on the producer and consumer side so we can better use compute resources available on the hardware platform. And there are different configurations that we can look at. You can have many uh, slow consumers because they're doing maybe some heavyweight database operation. And then you'd have a few fast producers. Because they are fast, they can produce uh, the intermediate results quickly. So you don't need that many of those threads. Versus the slow consumers, you need more of those threads because it's taking more CPU time for them to process. So you want to give them more threads or more compute resources for them to operate quickly. On the other extreme, you could have many slow producers because it's taking a long time for the producers to produce the intermediate results. And then you can have a few fast consumers. So these are two extremes of the configurations that you can have. Or you could have anything in the middle. So you could have equal number of producers and equal number of consumers. So the choice of how many producers and how many consumers you have depends on the amount of compute uh, operations one of each one of those threads have to do. So if threads are doing a lot of compute, you want to have more of them to balance the system and vice versa. So in this presentation, we'll specifically explore two different approaches to implementing the producer-consumer model. In our examples, we'll try and keep it simple with just one producer and one consumer so we can actually understand how these systems are working. Uh, first, we look at a busy weight approach. This is a simpler approach, which will use a standard mutex that we've already learned. Uh, this is simpler, but it does consume a little bit more CPU. Then we will look at a sleep wake up approach using what are known as monitors or conditional variables. Uh, the sleep wake up approach is a little bit involved, but is definitely a little bit more efficient than the busy weight approach um, that we'll see first. All right, now let's take a look at the busy waiting approach and we'll see why it is called busy waiting as well. So we're gonna implement the producer consumer model here. So we're gonna have our standard uh, includes along with the include for a queue because we wanna use an intermediate queue. And then here we are gonna use a global namespace um, called producer consumer or PC. This is to encapsulate all of the variables that will be shared by the threads. Uh, these are not quite global variables because we are actually putting it into a proper namespace. Uh, yes, in some sense, they are global variables, but we are encapsulating them in a namespace here to address some of the issues with global variables. So we're gonna have a shared queue. Uh, here, we're gonna assume the queue size is gonna be five. And then there's gonna be queue mutex that is gonna arbitrate access to this queue so that when threads are operating, they have to lock and unlock this mutex to get exclusive access to the shared queue. And avoid race conditions, of course. So here we're gonna assume the max queue size is five. The size of the queue will vary depending on how many threads you have based on the hardware configurations of uh, modern servers. So if you have big servers with many cores, you would increase the queue size. So if, let's say you have 128 cores, maybe the queue size can be 512 or even 1024. So depending on the hardware availability, you will have bigger or smaller queues. And then we're going to have two methods, one called producer, one called consumer, doing the corresponding operations. And they're going to produce some given number of items in this example. So producer is going to produce num items, consumer is going to consume that many items. And then in our main method, we're going to create a producer thread. Uh, here specifically, we're going to produce 50,000 items. So the producer is going to keep on adding items to the queue uh, through, by locking the queue mutex as long as there is space in the queue. And then we're going to create a consumer that's going to read and do some processing with the data from the queue. And again, the consumer is going to consume 50,000 items, so we're going to keep them all coordinated. And of course, we'll wait for the producer-consumer threads to finish by calling the join method. 
All right, now let's look at how the producer would be implemented. So we're going to produce num number of items. So I'm going to have a while loop uh, with i indicating the number of items. So we're going to generate num number of items. Uh, we're just going to generate random numbers uh, in the range 0 to 20,000 in this example. It's just an example, so we're generating random numbers. And then uh, I want to be able to add the number to the queue, but I have to try it over and over because the queue might be full. So I so if the queue is less than the max queue size, note that it's a logical check. We want to add the value to the queue and set the value to minus one so we can break out of that loop, uh, while loop there. Otherwise, the producer has to idle because here the queue is full, the producer has to idle. So we're just going to track how many times we had to idle. Notice here we are going to work on a shared queue here. So we have to lock the queue mutex and unlock the queue mutex so that we establish a proper critical section there because we will be accessing and checking the shared queue. So we want to do all of the operations inside the critical section. And then at the end, we're just going to print how many times the producer idled just for reference, how many times we had to run through that while loop before we were able to successfully add a value. We're going to do somewhat analogous things in the consumer. Uh, keep in mind, we're going to do the same idling and track the number of items generated. Uh, of course, these are two different methods, so all of the parameters and local variables are different for these two methods, and they're operating on different threads as well. So what the consumer is going to do is it has to consume the data. So it's going to remove data from the queue, from the front of the queue. So it'll read the data and then pop the uh, value off of the queue. But we're going to do that only if the queue is not empty, right? I mean, if the queue is empty, there's nothing to pop or remove. So we can do this operation only when the queue is not empty. But if the queue is empty, we are idling. So we're going to track the idle time. And then since we're operating a shared uh, queue, we're going to have to lock the mutex, unlock the mutex, so that we have a critical section established there. So we're going to lock and unlock those mutexes. Of course, here you can use the lock guard um, or the shared lock in C++17. But here we're trying to keep the producer consumer somewhat similar so that you can see the similarities between the two. And of course here, uh, once we remove the value from the queue, the consumer is going to do some processing with it. Here it's just doing something simple as in an empty while loop dec decrementing the value. So it's just putting a very little compute load on the CPU. And of course here we print how many times the consumer idled as well. Keep in mind, we are trying to keep the critical sections as fast as possible, but performing most of the heavyweight computations like generating random numbers or processing the data outside the critical section. So that's important to note that processing is happening outside the critical section because we want to keep the critical section as short and as fast as possible. Keep in mind the producer consumer example in the previous two slides works correctly without race conditions because we have correctly written um, the critical section. That means no two threads are in the same critical section simultaneously. This is because threads use a single lock to ensure that only one thread is modifying or operating on the shared queue. We have not made any assumptions about the speed or number of uh, CPU cores, etc. And then no thread outside the critical section may block the thread inside the critical section because there's only a single mutex here. So a thread outside the CS cannot block a thread inside the critical section. And none of the threads wait forever. Um, so we are not doing something, so we're not doing uh, any operations inside the critical section. We're doing all of the compute operations. So even if you do some sleep or something like that, we're doing it outside the critical section and not in the critical section to keep it really fast. However, the solution is not efficient in the sense that there is some wasted CPU cycles. In fact, there's a lot of wasted CPU cycles. Uh, when the queue is full, then the producer threads will keep trying to spin uh, or keep trying to add uh, items to the queue, but they won't be successful because the queue is full. Corresponding, the consumer threads will spin in a loop when the queue is empty. That means they'll keep on going and checking for work in the uh, queue. If the queue is empty, they, they keep spinning. So if you look at the example, notice that this while loop keeps on looping if the queue is full. So that means each thread, the producer thread, imagine multiple thread, producer threads are running. They all have to go lock the queue, check if the queue is full, unlock the queue, go back again, lock the queue, 
check if the queue is full. If it is full, unlock the queue. So that means they go in this loop while the queue is full and they constantly lock and unlock these and try to do operations which is simply consuming CPU time without getting any useful work done. And this is where the inefficiency comes into the picture. And you can, of course, measure how much uh, efficiency or inefficiency you have by using the USR bin time. We looked at this uh, one in a previous presentation. So here, if you run this busy weight approach, this is why it's called a busy weight because it's busy spinning in a loop. You'll see that the threads, two threads are running and they pretty much take 200% uh, of the CPU because they are constantly busy uh, in a spin lock or a spin loop, locking and unlocking, checking to see if there is work in the queue. So the producer consumer threads use two CPU cores and they keep on using CPU cores even when there is no effective progress of work being done. And this wastes energy due to that busy weight loop or a spin loop. That's why it's called a busy weight strategy or a spin lock strategy where we are constantly spinning trying to get the locks and check the shared queue. So this is a disadvantage, that means energy efficiency or lack of energy efficiency is a disadvantage of the busy weight approach. But it also has an advantage in that it is relatively straightforward to implement. And then the threads respond immediately when the work is available. So there is no, there's not even a little bit of overhead in context switching and such. The response time will be very good. So this kind of an implementation is great for interactive tasks like video games, um, or if you're trying to do some real-time response systems, like you know, you want to apply brakes in a car, or you want to do some self-driving car, you're willing to compromise on energy to get safety. So you, this kind of a busy weight approach is a good solution for those situations where the safety concerns override the energy concerns. Or here, of course, you can use it for video games where you want to have a good response rate. Again, here you're compromising on energy to give good user experience. In those cases, these busy weight uh, approaches are often used in software systems. Now let's look at a sleep wake up approach. The sleep wake up approach is an alternative approach for the produce, implementing the producer consumer problem. And here it is a substitute for the busy weight approach and addresses some of the efficiency issues in the busy weight approach. So here in the sleep uh, wake up approach, a thread basically goes to sleep. That means it goes into the blocked or waiting state. If you remember the state transition uh, life cycle uh, state chart, the thread will go into the block state when there isn't work to do. Another thread will wake up this sleeping thread when a work is available. Keep in mind, the producer is generating the work. So the producer will wake up a consumer thread every time it creates some work to be processed. And this basically eliminates the busy waiting approach and improves the efficiency, CPU efficiency, uh, and energy efficiency of the solution. A lot of the modern operating systems provide support for the sleep wake up model. And the way it is implemented is using a special variable. It's called a monitor or it is called a condition variable. So those two words are used interchangeably. You can either call it a monitor. Keep in mind, this is not the display monitor, but this is a monitor that monitors the sleep and wake up uh, solution. So it's like an alarm clock, that kind of a monitor. This is also known as a condition variable. And we'll look at the use of condition variables soon. Uh, of course, monitors do need a mutex to operate because they still have to create a critical section. So they do need a mutex to operate to create critical sections. C++ provides a nice uh, API called a condition variable. Notice that condition variable is also a concept. Condition underscore variable is the implementation in C++. So you make sure you uh, try to keep those two separate. Condition variable is a concept. You can apply it in any programming language, but std condition underscore variable is the implementation of a condition variable in C++. Here with condition variables, we, we have to use it with a, what is known as a unique lock, uh, and we'll see how, why the unique lock is used because of the way these condition variables work. We need to use a unique lock, and we cannot use a lock guard or scope lock with condition variables. All right, let's look at how the producer-consumer model looks in code with the sleep-wake-up strategy. Because we have our standard pound includes, we're going to create our standard namespace with our shared queue and a mutex to synchronize access to the queue. And then we're going to assume the same queue size of five. We're going to have a producer-consumer methods. We will look at their implementation soon.
And then our main method, we're going to start, of course, our producer consumer threads, again, generating and consuming 50,000 items. And then we're going to wait for the threads to finish. This is the same basic structure we had in the previous busy wait approach. But we're going to start making changes to this. First, we're going to pound include the condition variable header. And then we're going to use this add a condition variable, which is also called a monitor, which is going to avoid busy waiting. And it'll basically enable these threads to block or go into a sleep sleeping state until a condition is met. When a condition is met, you can use this condition variable to notify or wake up other threads that are sleeping. Of course, the condition variable requires a already locked mutex for doing some of this operation. Let's look at how the producer would be implemented with the sleep wake up strategy. Uh, we are going to generate some number of uh, items to be added to the queue. First, we are going to lock the queue mutex. Notice that here we are using a unique lock uh, to lock the mute, uh, queue mutex rather than a lock guard, and that is an important change to note. Then we are going to say wait for a condition to be met. Notice that here we are using that condition variable, and we are saying condition variable block and wait on this lock, notice that it's a unique lock, until the queue size is less than max queue size. Notice how the condition is read. Condition, wait until the queue size is less than max queue size, okay? So what happens with this wait method call on that condition variable is the thread will release the lock and goes to sleep. So the releasing the lock is important so that another thread can get the lock and do some operations on the shared queue if it needs to. And then when the when this thread is woken up by a different thread, it'll reacquire that unique lock. That means it'll get back the lock and your method will continue. Okay? And we'll just we'll see this wait method in a little bit more detail soon. Notice that this example uses what is known as a lambda method or Lambda is an anonymous method to detect condition on the shared queue, and we'll look at lambdas in a little bit more detail as well. Of course, once we get the lock, when we come to this line of code, we are in the critical section, and we know that uh, the size of the queue is less than max queue size. So here, the producer generates and adds a value into the queue. And then notice that there is a uh, notify one method that's called here. This notify one method basically wakes up another thread. In our example, it will be the consumer thread that will wake up to let the thread know that there is some work that's been added to the queue. Of course, here, instead of the notify one, you can use notify all to wake up all of the threads that are waiting on the same condition variable. Sometimes waking up all of the threads might be needed, but here we're just gonna wake up one thread at a time. Keep in mind here, the a uh, unique lock is automatically unlocked at the end of the for loop uh, because of the way the unique lock works. The destructor of unique lock all automatically unlocks. So each iteration of the for loop, we get a lock, check and wait for the condition that the queue has some space, generate a random meter, add it to the queue, notify the consumer thread it has some work to do, and the loop keeps on happening. Now let's look at how the consumer is going to do. Uh, again, same for loop to process that many number of items. Again, it's going to use the same unique lock to get a lock on the shared queue because it's the same mutex we're going to lock. Here, the consumer is going to wait uh, until the queue is not empty. So notice, that, notice the difference between producer. Producer is checking to make sure that the queue has space. The consumer is trying to make sure that some, the queue is not empty so it can get some data and process it. Again, here, the consumer will remove the values, uh, get the value in the front, and pop it off the queue. And then we notify the producer thread that something has been consumed. So that in case the producer is sleeping, it will wake up and start uh, generating the next item for the consumer to process. And this is where the notify one comes in uh, to wake up the producer. And then we unlock the uh, critical section so that the producer can operate. And then we do any operations that we need uh, outside of the critical section. Notice that the critical section ends when we unlock. Whatever processing we do should be outside the critical section so that the critical section is fast. 
Let's look at the operation of the wait method in a little bit more detail. So the wait method causes the calling thread to block and wait until the condition variable is notified by another thread and that optional predicate, predicate is basically a method that returns a Boolean value, until that predicate, which we have implemented as a lambda, until that lambda returns true, this wait method will block and wait. That's basically what it does. So first, how this wait method operates is first it'll release the lock on the given mutex. So that means it'll release the unique lock temporarily. It'll add this thread to the list of threads waiting on that condition variable so that kernel or the operating system will know that this thread is waiting on this condition variable. It'll block and wait until the thread is woken up either by a notify one or notify all call. If it is notify one, you do not know which thread will wake up. The operating system will pick some thread and wake it up that's waiting on this condition variable. And then when notified that this thread will unblock, again get a lock on the mutex that it, it previously released on step one. And then it'll check that predicate to see if it is satisfied. If the predicate returns false, it'll go back to step one and keep waiting. Otherwise, if the predicate is satisfied, that means the, the lambda returns true, the method will return control back to the calling program. So the wait method constantly internally has an internal loop that keeps on waiting until a condition is met. Let's also look at the interaction between the two threads as part of the sleep uh, wait notifier or the sleep wake up uh, approach. So here, assume two threads are running and they're going to work on that mutex and the shared condition variable between the two threads. So thread A is going to try and get a lock on the mutex and it's going to call the wait method so that it, the predicate is met. Um, so it goes in and it'll check to see if the predicate is true. Meanwhile, assume thread B is also coming in. It tries to get a unique lock on the mutex, but thread alpha has already got that lock. So thread beta basically has to block and wait. Notice that it's no longer running. It goes into the sleep state, so it's not consuming any CPU. Thread beta is not consuming any CPU. Thread alpha is still running. So if the check is done, the wait method will return. That cv.wait will return, and thread alpha can do some more operations. Okay, let's say if the condition is not met, let us assume the condition is not met, then thread alpha will block, goes to sleep, but before it goes to sleep, it releases the lock on the mutex. So when it releases the lock, the operating system internally knows now that thread alpha could potentially get the lock back. So thread alpha then acquires the lock because of the operating system's internal operations, and it starts running. So now a thread beta is running, thread alpha is not running. Then it'll do some processing, and after it's processing, it'll call cv.notify. Specifically, it'll say notify one or notify all. That notify call then goes back and wakes up the sleeping thread alpha. Then the sleeping thread alpha will wake up and wait to reacquire the lock on the mutex. Then thread beta will release the lock once the lock is released, thread alpha now wakes up, goes back, checks to see if the predicate is true, and the cycle repeats over and over until uh, the predicate is met and the wait expires and the thread can do its operations. So this is the interaction between wait and notify, wait being the sleep call, notify being the wake up. Uh, keep in mind, wait and notify are C++ or the API terminology uh, versus the sleep wake up is like the concept that we are looking at. Let's also take a quick peek at lambdas or first class functions. C++ supports these first class functions. What does it mean to be a first class function? Is that functions can be arguments to other methods and functions. And this is the feature that was used in the wait method to accept the predicate. And of course, a first class function means you can return the function uh, from a method. And of course, you can store functions as if they were variables, so you can operate on functions as if they are variables. These are called first class functions, and C supports first class functions. Um, here, lambdas are specifically anonymous methods, that means they don't have a name associated with them. The idea of a lambda is to improve functionality and code readability and code maintenance. 
And as a general rule of thumb, it's best to have very short lambdas. Usually it should not be more than one statement, one C++ statement. And lambdas are accepted in several API methods. A lot of the APIs will accept lambdas, but different APIs will require different methods because the operations are different. You will have to pass in different lambdas for different types of API methods. Let's take a quick under look at how lambda syntax works. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, let's say you have this method. Here it's a method's name is called has uh, some space. It returns a Boolean value. Checks to see if q.size is less than 5. Something very simple. So what happens with the lambda is lambdas are anonymous methods. That means these methods don't have a name. So we typically remove the name of that method and then replace it with, with just a open square bracket, close square bracket. So instead of a name of a method, you just see open square bracket, close square bracket. And then what typically will happen is these lambdas to keep them short and easy to read will typically not even put the return value because the return value is deduced by the compiler based on the return statement in there. So you can typically drop those return values and this results in a lambda, which is usually written as one line of code. So you'll simply say open square bracket, close square bracket. Uh, you can think of it as the name of the method if you want, but this name, lambdas do not have names because they are anonymous methods. And the square bracket serves as a placeholder for what is known as a capture class, which can be used to wrap up variables within the lambda from the outer scope. So for example, if you ever want to use C out, this is how you would do it. You will pass a reference to C out into the lambda. Notice that this is not a parameter, this is not an argument to the lambda. This is different. This is a capture class where you're capturing a variable from an outer scope and here you're passing it through reference into that lambda for use. Of course, lambdas can also accept arguments. Notice that here C out is coming as part of the capture class. There is a parameter called uh, uh, par parameter integer i and then you're printing i. Notice the difference between parameters and capture class for lambdas. There are different ways you can use lambdas. We'll just go through a couple of examples just to illustrate the use of lambdas. Uh, specifically, look at the C++ algorithms methods in the algorithms library. So let's generate a bunch of, uh, uh, read a bunch of uh, numbers uh, from a console into a vector. And then notice how the sort uh, algorithm is used. Here we are going to sort the numbers from the beginning to the end of the list. And notice the lambda there, it takes two integers because the vector has integers, we're gonna compare two integers and return some sorting order, y is less than x or x is less than y. And depending on the order you compare, you will sort in ascending or descending order. Notice that here, everything that you need to know for the sort algorithm is right there in that one line of code. So that way you know exactly how the numbers are gonna be sorted. You don't have to go anywhere else to try and figure out how is it being compared, what is the comparison being happening? All the information is almost right there. Here's another example of uh, a copy if algorithm that basically copies numbers. Here we are doing x modulo 2 is equal to 0, so basically it ends up copying even numbers. And notice that here the lambda just takes one uh, parameter. And then here is a, another algorithm called for each, which iterates over each number and does some operation. Here we are doing a catcher class for the C out and taking integer i as a parameter because for each requires that kind of a lambda. C out is optional, but for each requires um, to take it one parameter. And then it prints a string. So if you compile and run this program and you input 5, 4, 6, 1, 3, 2, some inputs, here's the output from the program and it prints a bunch of stars on the screen for all the even numbers that was entered as inputs. Just an example of how lambda works and illustrating the lambda syntax, that's about it. All right, let's do a quick summary of what we did in this presentation. Uh, we have two diff we looked at the producer consumer problem uh, to coordinate multiple threads and we looked at two different approaches. Uh, first one is the busy wait approach, which consumes some CPU time, but the threads respond quickly. When we looked at user bin time, you will see that it took uh, it was using two cores all the time. Then we looked at the sleep wake up approach using condition variables or monitors. Here, idle threads don't consume CPU because they go to sleep. And then, but there is some extra overhead for the sleep and wake up notifications because the operating system has to get involved to wake up sleeping threads. 
And of course, if the program does not have a notify call to wake up threads, you have to, your program will deadlock. So you should not forget the wake up, the notify or notify all calls. Otherwise, your program will deadlock. And of course, if you do the timing on this one, you'll notice that the sleep wake up approach takes much less CPU because sleeping threads don't consume CPUs. So they go to sleep without consuming CPU. So the overall CPU time, uh, percentage CPU used will be lower, but it'll still be more than uh, 90 or 100% because two threads are running. So you'll see a little bit more than uh, 100%. And also notice that the time, the uh, busy wait is a little bit faster. This is a small example. So the difference might might seem is small, but it is definitely, the busy wait is definitely faster, runs in about uh, 1.33 seconds, versus the sleep wake up takes a little bit more time. Notice that it's 1.39 seconds. So as the problems become larger, the difference between these times will definitely grow but it will not be significantly different, but it will definitely be different enough that if you have a um, system where you need very good response, you should go with the busy wait approach versus if you want to design a system that is very energy efficient, you want to go with the sleep wake up approach. And both of these systems are good depending on the problem you're trying to solve and the depending on the type of system properties you're trying to accomplish. You want a system that is highly responsive, then you go for the busy weight approach. You want a system that is very uh, energy efficient or CPU efficient, you should go for the sleep wake up approach. All right, let's do a quick series recap. We've done introduction and in, to threading and synchronization and the basics of multi-threading in programming in, and C++. We looked at timings and we've looked at the idea of race conditions and how to check and avoid race conditions. Uh, we've looked at threading without synchronizations. We did two parts of those, uh, basically in data parallel applications, task parallel applications, and also using uh, detached or background threads. Then we did threading with synchronization with one resource. And then we did threading with multiple resources. This is where we looked at the dining philosophers model. And now we did thread synchronization using the producer consumer model to coordinate multiple threads doing different kinds of operations. Hope you found this presentation interesting and useful. Don't forget to check out the other presentations in this series.